Hello and welcome to The Week in 60 Minutes. Uh, we were just wrapping up uh, this week's episode when we learned the sad news that Queen Elizabeth II has died after seven decades on the throne. So we're going to start the programme by talking about the late Queen uh, and I am joined now by Charles Moore who's a former editor of The Spectator as well as a former editor of The Daily Telegraph and The Sunday Telegraph. And we're also joined by James Forsyth, who is our political editor. Charles, it's been um, 70 years uh, since a British monarch died. Um, I appreciate it's uh, before your time, 1952, but um, perhaps using your historical knowledge, you could give us a sense of what a different country Britain was and the different position the monarchy was in uh, when Queen Elizabeth II acceded to the throne. Um, I think it's a bit misrepresented what happened then. Um, people now think of it as incredibly old-fashioned, and which in a way it was. But in another way it wasn't, because what it was was the recovery of confidence um, and uh, ceremony after the horrors of the Second World War. And it was, of course, it was a very young monarch. So people were very excited in... It was also the first television event, um, big public event on television in British, British history. And so it seemed very new, though its ritual was very ancient. Um, and the fact that a, a very young woman had become queen, and in fact become queen while having a holiday in uh, Kenya, um, was also part of this. This is a new thing. Hard to think of that now. It now seems almost prehistoric when you watch the, um, the, the, the uh, film. But um, it, it wasn't like that at the time. Yes, the, the televisual uh, aspect of her reign is very important, isn't it? It's, it, it's hard to uh, think of Elizabeth II without thinking about television. And, and so I, th I think British people actually started to buy television so that they could see the Queen. Is that not right? That is correct, yes. And not many people had television still. So enormous sums of people. I remember Frank Johnson, the, the Spectator's former editor, who was an East End boy, telling me about how they were crowded into his uncle's house in Shoreditch and sort of 40 of them all sat around watching and they could hardly see anything because a tiny, tiny screen for a film, but terribly exciting to, to watch it. James, um, there, there, there's already uh, some anxiety that uh, the Queen, who was this great unifying figure for the Union, uh, is now gone uh, and that the glue that bound the nation together, if you like, uh, is, is, is now, has now vanished. Um, do you think unionists are right to be concerned about the future? Uh, the Queen obviously uh, acted as a kind of great unifying force. And I think the mourning for her uh, will, will be testament to that. But I do think the unifying figure of the monarchy will, will remain in, 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 in a different way, in a different form. I think, I think, I think for King Charles it will be different for, than, it, than it was for her. But I think, I think he has... Uh, he comes to the crown kind of relatively late in life. He's in his seventies, and I think he will he will bring uh, that experience. And I think he is wise enough to know that as king, he will have to be uh, to be more private about his opinions than he was as Prince of Wales. Charles, are we about to see that? Um, because of course, everybody talks about how Queen Elizabeth represented continuity. Are we about to see that monarchy itself represents continuity, even more so perhaps than the late Queen? I think so. I think um, you shouldn't uh, talk of the Queen as, um, as if it's a sort of one-off special thing. And she would have been the last person in the world who would have wanted to see it that way. The point of the monarchical system is that, that it's dynastic and all its efforts go into perpetuating itself. Um, uh, it has no other means of um, survival. And the Queen did that triumphantly, um, both in terms of breeding, so that we've got this line stretching out before us for you know, what might be 100 years, never happened before, um, but also in terms of making the right provision. So, for example, she was very careful to ensure quite recently, actually, that the then Prince of Wales would become head of the Commonwealth when she died. Um, she carefully worked all that out. So... I don't expect a crisis of monarchy. Um, uh, what I do think is, will obviously be difficult in the short term, is that our whole way of thinking about the British monarchy has been very governed by this reign because it's so successful and so long. And um, some rethinking will require, I'll just make one point there, which is that now that the Queen is dead, the person with the, by far the longest experience of public life anywhere in the whole of the world 
is the new king. He has been, um, he's been an active figure on the international stage for more than 50 years. James, what do you think was the most uh, precarious moment, perhaps, of Elizabeth's reign? Because th th there were moments of crisis, crisis, crises uh, in the 70s and 80s. Um, what, where, do you, where do you think she had her most difficult period as monarch? I, I think there are two. Uh, 1992, the Annas Horribilis, and then 1997, after the death of Diana, Princess of Wales, when I, I think the Queen, in her desire to to protect, understandable desire to protect her own family, I kind of misread the public mood, and uh, and I think I think in some ways that was that was a very difficult moment for the monarchy, given how emotionally volatile the country was at, at that point. But I think what stands out to me is that in this seventy-year reign, that the, the longest in British history, you know, those uh, those, those mistakes are so much smaller than the equivalent mistakes made by Queen Victoria when you think about the, the, the bedchamber crisis or, um, or Queen Victoria's withdrawal from public life after Prince Albert's death. Charles, do you, do you think um, after the death of Diana and obviously there was a lot of tumult there, uh, that uh, Queen Elizabeth uh, and the monarchy, in fact, came out stronger because of it? I do think so. I think it was, um, it was difficult. But really, the, the profound difficulty lasted for five days. It was from the princess died on a Sunday, the trouble began on a Monday, and the queen calmed it by her broadcast on the Friday, and the funeral was the following day. And um, actually, um, the queen was perhaps slow off the mark in seeing exactly how you would need to deal with this question. But when she did see, in this very, very short period, she got it absolutely right on that Friday with her broadcast and brought the nation together in time for the funeral. So uh, I don't think even if, if she got that wrong, it would have been ultimately disastrous. And I certainly didn't agree with the people at the time or later who say that it threatened the monarchy. But I think um, it, was, it was difficult. It did show up some real problems. Um, uh, and it was the nearest we ever got to quite strong public criticism of the Queen. Um, all those things were important, but all those things were overcome. Charles, I wanted to end by asking you about the Queen's faith, uh, because she was... Uh, a devout Christian in an age that uh, is often called post-Christian. Um, how important do you think was religion to the way the Queen looked at the world and the way the Queen uh, behaved as a monarch? I think it was absolutely central to the Queen's approach, uh, not only because she took her role as Supreme Governor of the Church of England very seriously, but for more profound uh, reasons. Um, that was her faith. Um, and she had a particular type of Christian faith, which is very acquired, but is all pervading. So each day um, she prayed every night and she, each Sunday she attended church. Um, and she was very much of that school, I think, which doesn't want to talk about it, but does want to do it, um, to practice more than to preach. Whenever she did preach, which was very, very slightly at her Christmas broadcast, the name of Jesus would usually come in and the Christmas message in some way would always come in. A Christian message at Christmas. And um, I think it explains the way she did so much by stealth. You have to think, in order to understand the Queen, you have to understand uh, the things you didn't quite see or that she didn't quite say as much as the things that she did. And that's very characteristic of a certain humble Christianity, which is you're not showing off. You don't matter as yourself. It's your duty to God and your neighbour that matters. And that's that gives her... Uh, Life, lifelong uh, sustaining power. Do you think her religious instincts were perhaps more low church than uh, you might expect from a, a head of the church? Um, maybe, but I, I think it's very important that the Queen didn't have, was absolutely uninterested in religious parties and factions. In fact, um, you know, would have regarded them as a very, very bad news. And um, this also explains her attitude to other faiths. Um, and other denominations of Christianity. Um, nobody could ever, she was a, a strong, quite old fashioned Protestant Anglican, but nobody could ever say she was trying to sort of advance that in some argumentative or disparaging way against anyone else. And she famously formulated the doctrine that the Church of England could be a sort of umbrella for other denominations and other faiths. And I, that was very clearly recognized by Jews and Muslims and so on. Um, she, she understood that 
um, if she was going to follow in the footsteps of Jesus, which in her quiet way she was trying to do, uh, she must always show love and respect for people, not be disapproving of them. James, we now have uh, a new king um, and Britain will now have to think about the role of the Church of England um, in uh, public life. Uh, do you think we will now see a monarchy that has to concentrate more on, its, on the religious aspect and, and, and the sacred aspects of it? I think the coronation will, will obviously bring those things to the fore. Uh, I, I think, though, that uh, as Charles said, I think, that, I think the Church of England has it is the Church of the country, and I think that I think the royal family has done a very astute job of you know for all the divisions within the Anglican Communion on all sorts of issues, the royal family has done a very astute job of of, of avoiding getting drawn into those. Charles, you knew the Queen a little bit. Uh, I, there's going to be a lot of talk about her character, what she was really like and so on, but I wonder if you could tell us, uh, is there an aspect of her personality that you think the public uh, misses? Well, no, I think, I think her integrity was apparent. What I think it perhaps needs emphasis, which I, I find in a way the most extraordinary thing about her, is her absolute lack of vanity. Um, here you are... Um, all your life, and certainly from when you knew you were going to be uh, heir to the throne, people have been flattering you every single day. So she probably has received flattery for 96 years. I don't think one little bit of it went to, to her head. I don't think she ever thought, aren't I clever, aren't I brilliant, gosh, didn't I do well, aren't I beautiful, etc. None of, I really, none of those things at all. She had an inner dignity and therefore an inner self-confidence but literally no vanity. And that's the most extraordinary achievement. I think, I can't think of anyone famous who's like that. Charles, James, thank you very much indeed. Hello, and welcome to the Week in 60 Minutes. My name is Freddie Gray, and I will be your host today. You may have heard that Britain has a new Prime Minister, so we're going to spend this episode uh, talking about whether Britain is ready to be led by Liz Truss and whether Liz Truss is ready to lead Britain. I will talk to James Forsyth and Katie Balls about the political situation and Liz Truss's first few days. I will also talk to Julian Jessup and Hamish McRae about Trussonomics, Can It Possibly Work?, uh, and we'll, we'll round out our politics section by talking about the legacy of Boris Johnson, who left office this week. I'll be joined by Andrew Jimson. We'll then move internationally to look at the bubbling war over microchips between America and China. And we will round off uh, by talking to everybody's favourite columnist, Rod Little, about the BBC and bias. First of all, I'm very pleased to be joined by The Spectator's political editor, James Forsyth, and The Spectator's deputy political editor, Katie Balls. And we're going to be analysing Liz Truss's first week. Uh, James, I'll start with you. Um, it's hard to think of a prime minister who started uh, with such low expectations uh, surrounding them. Uh, this could, of course, be an advantage for Liz Truss. Do you think she will benefit from the fact that... Uh, the general mood about politics and about Britain at the moment is so gloomy. Yeah, I think there is, there is a paradox of a situation that, that she finds herself in, which is she comes in with, you know, delete as appropriate, you know, the worst in since, you know, 1066 of any prime minister. But there is, there is a plus side to her for that, which is there are few moments when the public look to politics and, and, and really pay attention. And this is one of them. People want to know what is happening to their energy bills. People want to know what the government is going to do. So Liz Truss, who is, for someone who has been a senior politician for, for quite some time, is, is relatively unknown to the public. There isn't a, a, a view of her formed among voters yet. I think, I think things are still in flux. She has a chance to introduce herself, to show that she can be decisive, to show that she can offer leadership. And I, I think that is an opportunity. I think that, you know, this is... But she, she, she has the nation's attention right now. 
Do you think the fact that she's not slick, James, sticking with you, do you think the fact that she's not seen as slick and that Rishi Sunak was often portrayed as slick, you know, perhaps unfairly sometimes, um, but do you think that public perception is actually advantageous with Britain because British people don't really like slickness? I, I think what Liz Truss will try and do is, is make a virtue of it. She does this thing of saying, you know, what you see is what I... With me, what you see is what you get. You know, she emphasises that she's not the best presenter. Um, but, but I think that what she will try and... Do, but I think also it is worth remembering that, you know, her public... Uh, she's also, I think, a confidence politician. When things are going well for her, she gets better. I think you saw that during the Tory leadership contest. In the, in the first debate, when the parliamentary rounds were proving very difficult for her, she didn't turn in a great performance. As things got better, you know, that royal jelly of confidence began to, 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 to have its effect. And she became better and better. And I think you saw in her speech outside Downing Street, you know, that she did what she needed to do. Uh, at Prime Minister's questions, she turned, you know, she was in command of a house. And, you know, she is going to take a very different approach to Boris Johnson. Boris Johnson was, you know, lots of bluster. Liz Truss answered the questions at PMQs and actually chose to put kind of clear ideological blue water between her and Keir Starmer. Keir Starmer went on pushing her on a windfall tax. Liz Truss was adamantly against it. Now, there is obviously a risk in that, in that the polling suggests that even Conservative voters are in favour of another windfall tax, we should say, because there already is one in place. But I think you see here that she is, she is uh, on, on, on that kind of question, she is willing to enter into an ideological argument. Obviously, the energy policy that she is uh, announced on Thursday, you know, that is, is about as far from a free market position as you can get. And that, I think, shows that she is this intriguing mix of uh, ideological and pragmatic. Katie, uh, we have uh, a new cabinet uh, and two things struck me uh, looking at the new cabinet. The first one was that um, almost every single woman on there has been on your podcast, Women With Balls. Uh, so I recommend all uh, Spec TV listeners, viewers, uh, tune in to uh, Katie's podcast. The second is uh, what everybody said, which is that it seems to be a case of uh, loyalty has been rewarded. Um, is this a very tight pack? So I think when you look at the cabinet that she has assembled, as you say, loyalty is the key word. Um, I think there's also, to a degree, because Rishi Sunak and this trust were so apart when it came to the economic debate of what we saw in the contest. So members, his supporters suggesting Dominic Raab electoral suicide note was what her uh, tax cuts would mean. Um, I think it, the view of the of team trust is effectively it's quite hard to have people who've gone so hard against the plans to suddenly be in senior roles, going on media rounds, having to defend her government's message. So I, I think that was one of the factors, but also she, she wants those who have, uh, you know, backed her from the beginning or, you know, uh, taken on uh, difficult situations to do so, to be rewarded. And you can see that running through. Um, I think when you look more widely at how that is going to work, there is some more reaching out in the junior ministerial ranks. Um, some Rishi Sunak supporters, Robert Jenrick and others brought in, which I think is intended to say, we, you know, we're not completely closed. Uh, there is a way back, but ultimately you need to get on board. Of course, when things start to get quite tricky for Liz Truss, this might not feel like a honeymoon yet, but th this effectively is her honeymoon stage. Um, it may be the other way around in the sense she will be, have to do, be doing more to get people to back her rather than you know, expecting people to come to her. She does have a fair few loyalists already, but um, it's also probably fair to say that quite, she has quite a few enemies within the Tory party. Are you picking up a, a lot of resentment and animosity? So I'm not sure if it's resentment, but I think there's definitely a lack of enthusiasm in lots of parts of the party towards Liz Truss. And ultimately, she, she had, you know, the, the lowest MP support um, if you think by compared to predecessors. So Theresa May, Boris Johnson, both won the highest number of MPs in the parliamentary round. Rishi Sunak won it in hers, which shows that she didn't have great parliamentary support. Now, she then overtook him, but I do think if uh, MPs back you when all the polls suggest you're storming ahead, it's not quite as sincere as doing it early on. And walking around Parliament speaking to MPs, uh, lots of MPs are pretty damn beat. They're 
not particularly inspired. But at the same time, I think everyone's so drained from how long this Tory leadership contest has gone on for, um, and also just how uh, brutal the last few months of Boris Johnson's leadership were, that at the moment, I don't get the sense that it's turning into lots of scheming about, you know, ways to get her out and so forth. And actually is perhaps more that uh, MPs are just resigned to the fact they don't have a leader for now they particularly agree with. Now that could bubble up on lots of issues as time goes on. Um, but yeah, I, th I think that is more the mood at the moment. James, do you think there's an appetite in the Tory party for a bit of unity for once? Uh, I mean, certainly as Casey suggested, the last few months of Boris were quite obviously the opposite of unity. Um, and the leadership contest was drawn out uh, and fractious. Is, is there a sort of widespread sense that now is the time to, to come together? Yeah, I mean, there is a realisation that they've got two years or so to a general election. You know, uh, anyone who thinks that you can you could change leader in that period again, you know, that is totally for the birds. I mean, imagine how the public would react to that. So I think the Tory party realises it does need to come together. I, I think the big, but I think the mood in the Tory party at, in, in the coming uh, months is going to be very much governed by the opinion polls. Uh, I think one of the challenges for anyone who becomes Prime Minister in midterm is that you don't have your own personal mandate and that affects both your relationship with your with the public but also your relationship with your own MPs. You know, Boris Johnson could always say to Tory MPs, look, you know, say what you like about what I'm doing here and there. You know, I won an 80 seat majority. You can you can trust my judgment. I, I get the public. Um, Liz Truss doesn't have that election winning record. So that will be more difficult for her. So I think I think a lot will depend on where the polls go, how things like her big energy announcement land with voters. Uh, and I think also how quickly she moves to unify. I think, I think Katie made a very interesting point there, which is you know, what, what the trust team are trying to say, essentially, with the, some of these junior ministerial appointments is, look, you know, you're there. You, know, you could move up if you show that you're kind of fully on board with, with the new regime. Uh, and, but I think, that will pro you know, I think that how she does that, how she handles it, will be very important. Katie, uh, we've been given the impression very much in the last few weeks that Labour's almost licking its lips at the prospect of a, a trust premiership. Uh, they saw her as an ideal opponent in many ways. Um, already in the last couple of days, people have started to say that uh, they have underestimated her. Um, do you get any impression from Labour people that uh, they're slightly more concerned than they were? I think they're slightly more concerned in the sense that when Liz Truss during the uh, leadership campaign talked about no handouts, um, and there is uh, you know, various briefings suggesting that rather than having you know, a big intervention, um, like one that she has now decided to do in terms of capping um, energy bills, freezing the price caps, she would do something such as just lots of different types of tax cuts. And I think that they thought, were she to be very um, strict like that in terms of her ideology that would be very easy for them to um, attack to criticize and the fact that she has been more pragmatic and gone for this big bold intervention has been as much harder for them to criticize now we see the new dividing line as windfall taxes the fact that this trust is against those but uh, i think they thought that the attack line could simply be that she wasn't doing enough and that is obviously wrong-footed them to a degree and then i think in terms of prime minister's questions um this trust again the low expectations that you were talking about earlier on um have benefited her because she had i think two good jokes um one about you know labor just seemed to just pick male leaders from North London um, and the other obviously I'm um, talking about taxation um, and the fact Labour didn't sound new and because uh, she delivered those fairly well it meant lots of people said well actually sh she has the upper hand in this exchange and I think just going against a female leader is a bit different than going against Boris Johnson in terms of um, how, how much you attack in those exchanges so uh, I think it will be a little while before Keir Starmer works out how best to approach um, uh, his interventions uh, and attacking of actually Liz Truss. Well, it'll be very interesting to see. Uh, James and Katie, thank you very much indeed. Now, uh, we're hearing the term trussonomics quite a lot, um, but what exactly is it and, and is it going to work? Um, I'm delighted to be joined by Julian Jessup, who is uh, an independent economist and one of the Truscateers, as they're known, um, uh, an unofficial uh, but nonetheless important advisor to Liz Truss on the economy. 
Um, I'm also joined by Hamish McRae, who is a, a financial commentator and economics commentator for The Independent, among others. Um, Julian, this morning, uh, the big bazooka has been fired um, at the energy crisis. Um, the freeze on the energy cap is going to be 2500 which is pretty high. Uh, the expectation is that will cost the British economy about $150 billion. Um, we fired quite a few big bazookas, uh, the British economy, uh, in the last few years. Um, and yet we seem to be lurching from crisis to crisis. Is this the right thing to do? Well, I think there are no good options here, but this is perhaps one of the, the least bad. Um, I think it, it is a bad option because it is another massive state intervention in, in, in markets. Um, the support is not particularly well targeted, so the biggest benefit goes to households who use more energy, who tend to, tend to be richer. Uh, and of course, as you say, it could also be enormously expensive. But um, I also think that given the, the scale of the shock uh, coming along the pipeline, uh, the government was going to have to do something big and bold anyway. Uh, and by announcing this major package today, it has at least lifted that massive cloud of uncertainty hanging over households and businesses about you know, what's going to happen this winter, maybe into, into next winter. Um, so it, it's got a massive price tag attached to it. But if it rescues the economy from a deep recession and you know, saves people from not being able to pay their bills over the winter, then I think that price is worth paying. Hamish, can I ask you a slightly political, less than economic question? I'm sorry to do so. Uh, but that yesterday, uh, Keir Starmer attacked... Uh, Liz Truss from the off and her first uh, Prime Minister's questions about um, the, uh, the, the, the this was a tax break for uh, major oil corporations um, and uh, and she was letting them off the hook uh, and there should be a windfall tax and so on and Liz Truss re responded as she has done quite a few times in the leadership campaign by saying you're looking at this the wrong way around you're looking at this in a very left-wing way do you think that's an effective argument politically I don't know. Um, I think that you know, we've got two years, they have got two years, to prove that they're competent government. And this is test one. Is this the competent way of fixing things? I think trying to see this in ideological terms actually doesn't excite the electorate. What they want is common sense, effective government, um, and I think they will reward or the reverse uh, in a couple of years' time. Julian, do you, do you think um, in about a year's time people will come to see the energy price freeze as an effective move, or do you think uh, they will just be facing even more problems on this front? Um, well, I think it, by definition it should fix this problem because basically the government has said however energy prices, however high they go um, over the next year or two, um, the government will pick up the bill rather than expecting it to land on individual households and businesses. So um, I think, it, in a sense, the, the policy has to work because that's, that's exactly how it's, how it's designed. Um, you also have to ask you know, what, what the alternatives are. I mean, interesting, as you say, that Labour has focused on the idea of uh, funding it from, from a windfall tax. But um, a lot of the numbers being tossed around here you know, don't really add up. I mean, the, the, the big numbers are about the global profits that energy companies are making, not the profits they're making just in the UK. Um, a lot of talk about so-called excess profits, but all that really means is profits that are higher than normal rather than necessarily outrageous. And above all, companies will be paying a lot more tax. So if you're a North Sea oil and gas producer at the moment, your marginal tax rate is going to be 65%. So um, it's not as if the Treasury won't already be benefiting uh, from higher revenues, from, from higher energy prices. So um, I think actually Liz Truss is probably right to resist calls for, for further windfall taxes. Because I think the priority now has to be to, to reassure businesses that the UK is going to be, continue to be a good place to invest, rather than constantly ratcheting up taxes on whichever sectors happen to be doing the best. Um, Julian, you are, uh, as previously mentioned, a, a Truscateer. Um, and the speculation is that among uh, your sort of cohort, which includes Liz Truss, she's been very interested in, in economics for a, a long time from a free market perspective, um, that among your cohort, there's been a sort of learning to love of deficits, or perhaps love is too strong, but certainly becoming far more relaxed about deficits and, and running up uh, government debt in order to stimulate growth. Have you personally changed a lot? Has Liz changed a lot on that front? 
Well, I, I, I've definitely been on a journey. I mean, my, my career started off in the, in the Treasury decades ago, and I, I would have been absolutely horrified at what the government has, has announced today. Um, even more recently, five or ten years ago, I, I would have been ne very narrowly focused on, on getting borrowing down very, very quickly. But um, I think we've learned that isn't necessarily the, the right thing to do. So the you know, austerity in the early 2010s probably meant that the, that the recession was, uh, was longer and more painful than it, than it needed to be. Um, and I think what we're learning is that you do need to be more flexible about fiscal policy in the short term to respond to shocks like this. But that has to be balanced by a credible medium to longer term plan to get the, uh, the stock of debt down relative to the size of the economy. So, you know, short term stimulus packages, tax cuts, loads of, loads of spending, that, that's fine for dealing with an immediate crisis. But you still need a longer term plan to, um, you know, keep spending under control, to grow the economy, and above all, to improve the supply side performance of the economy. Tax cuts might be part of that, but they're only a small part. There's a lot else that needs to be done as well. Hamish, uh, do you think uh, that um, the markets are sort of warming up a little bit to trust? I mean, the perception was that the, the markets preferred Sunak uh, and they weren't responding very well to the, to the incoming trust administration. Is that changing slightly? I still feel very, that they're very twitchy. Uh, and they'll go on being twitchy. They read swathes of negative stuff about the UK in general uh, and trust in particular in the American press. Uh, they read some of it in the British press. Uh, I think that's going to take a while to change. I think what changes it is actually the numbers turning out better than expected. Uh, and they did from the, uh, the pandemic, uh, uh, the correction after the pandemic, they, the deficit came down much faster than than the OBR expected. And with these numbers now, you hear the headline of 150 billion. What the government is doing is an insurance policy. <laughs> you know, it's putting a cap, it's carrying the burden above a certain level. It could be 150, it could be, it could be much less. And anyway, if you can get the RPI and the CPI down, if you can get the headline numbers of inflation down, you get a lot back. You, you don't have to increase your pension so much. You don't have to increase the payments on index-linked gilts, which are a quarter of our national debt. So I, I think these numbers may turn out to be quite a lot better than, than they look at the moment. I don't think the markets have yet done the sums. Well, give them a day or two. Uh, so let's wait and see how they respond in a week or two's time. But I think that um, at some stage, there's going to be a return of confidence for the UK. It ain't there yet. Julian, it's, it's widely said uh, among uh, free market, low tax uh, type people, that um, trust will need to uh, be willing to confront a lot of political pain uh, in order to um, reduce uh, the size of the state uh, and to let Britain become uh, a more prosperous and faster growing economy. Um, in your relation, in your experience with Liz Truss, do you think she's going to be willing to take that pain? Uh, I think definite yes to that. I think she's clearly somebody who is who's very decisive. I mean, she, she listens to advice, but the, she then comes to a firm view and acts upon it. Uh, obviously, she's only been Prime Minister for a few days, so we don't have much of a track record to base that on. But you know, the, the big, bold energy plan is a, is a good start. Uh, and her previous track record in government, particularly at the Department for International Trade, was that she was somebody who, to kind of phrase, delivers, delivers, delivers. So um, I would be optimistic that she will get things done. Um, the Conservative government still has a, a sizable majority in, in Parliament, and I, I know there are concerns about uh, some of the MPs who might have backed Rishi Sunak being still a bit wobbly. But uh, at the end of the day, I think if she wants to get things done, sh she will get things done. Um, she has to deal, first of all, with the energy crisis, but hopefully the, the plan that she's announced, the, the insurance policy, as Hamish put it, um, is enough to, to put that immediate crisis to bed. And then she can move on to the other things, you know, the, the supply side reforms in particular, uh, and the longer term changes in, in public spending that need to be done, you know, dealing with the crisis in the NHS and social care and state pensions and uh, on all those big pressing issues as well. Julian, Hamish, thank you very much indeed. We've talked quite a lot about the new Prime Minister. Let's talk instead about the lately departed Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, who has now left number 10. Uh, I'm delighted to be joined by Andrew Jimson, 
who is uh, the biographer of Boris Johnson, the, the not quite official, can we call you official biographer? Not official, no, no, unofficial. Unofficial, unofficial. On the first, it, when, I, when my first volume about him came out, he said I'd done quite enough work to avoid the charge of sycophancy. So <laughs> there, were, there were things in that volume and in the one that's coming out at the end of this month, which, which are not, um, which he would rather weren't in, in them. Well, the, the one that's coming out at the end of the month is called Boris Johnson, The Rise and Fall of a Troublemaker in Number 10. Uh, I think you have a copy there. Do you want to? I do. I do it? have it. That's what it looks like. <laughs> right. Uh, and you uh, worked with Boris Johnson at the Spectator. In fact, you were foreign editor. I did. I I came back from Berlin. Um, I think the year after he'd become editor, and he invited me to be foreign editor. And I went to the Thursday morning conferences. And I must say, I've been to editorial conferences at many different publications, but never conferences where there was so much laughter. Uh, as there was at Boris Johnson's editorial conferences. And one of the great things about him, actually, was he didn't expect us all to be the same as him. He was a a sort of go-getter. He always wanted to get the interview with Berlusconi or Mugabe or some implausibly um, famous uh, and possibly scandalous figure. But he didn't mind if the rest of us weren't sort of go-getters like that. So he he quite liked having me as a foreign editor who never went abroad and did no editing. Uh, he, he was undoubtedly, still is in many ways, a brilliant journalist. Uh, the jury, I'd say, still out on him as a statesman. Um, yes. Um, e- Enoch Powell said that all political lives end in failure, famously. Uh, I thought I'd start by asking, do you think uh, his career has, political career has ended, first of all, and can it be called a failure? I think the chances are that it hasn't ended, but of course we won't know. But he has had a gift for putting himself at the centre of the story ever since he went to Brussels in 1989 as the Daily Telegraph's correspondent. And I think he'll continue to put himself at the centre of the story. He can't help but do that. Uh, and it's perfectly conceivable. I just, oddly enough, as I was walking um, over to The Spectator, I met a, um, a Conservative backbencher and he said, do you think Boris will ever come back? Uh, and I said, well, maybe. I said, only if the Tory party's in desperate trouble. And he said, oh, well, we're bound to be in desperate trouble before long. So. <laughs> Um, <laughs> that's not such a remote, um, I mean the Tories were in desperate trouble the first time he got it and they overcame their doubts about him and he rescued them from Nigel Farage and got Brexit done. So um, who knows, perhaps they'll need rescuing from someone else. Well I, I suppose uh, people can and do make the case that he's not a failure because of uh, Brexit, because of the vaccine rollout uh, and because of his tough stance on Ukraine. Um, but you could also make the case that, you know, he did go from having this thumping mandate um, about two years ago. And um, he now is uh, leaving not quite, pretty much in disgrace, actually. He's, he's leaving as a, as a politician with a, his tail between his legs, certainly. I think this is an argument not only about what Boris Johnson is like, uh, but also what this country is like. And uh, I think essentially our idea of liberty includes being able to kick out prime ministers when pretty much the moment we get fed up with them. We don't have fixed terms. And we got fed up with Boris Johnson. We like our prime ministers to be precarious. Um, They always are precarious. It's surprising, actually, that Margaret Thatcher, for example, lasted as long as she did for the whole of the 1980s. Um, Boris Johnson hasn't, uh, at least on his first stint, lasted that long. But I don't think that means... I don't think you can judge... I don't think you can judge political success and failure simply in terms of how long someone has served in a particular office. And, and in fact, he, he uh, actually acknowledged the, what he called, the, the, I think he called it glorious Darwinianism. He called it, he praised the Darwinianism of, of the system in his resignation speech. So he's, he, you would think he'd accept that that's part of the, uh, the way British politics works. Yes, but he's, I, th- I think he, he sees British politics in rather ancient Greek terms. Uh, a hero is set trials by the gods, sometimes fortune abandons him, and then fortune, just as capriciously, may return and smile on him, and actually voters rather like an implausible comeback, and may get very, very bored with what, or, or, or frustrated or fed up with whatever um, happens next. So uh, he, 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 although I think he's deeply wounded by being rejected by his own party, and that is a, a deep wound, he also somehow... He, he, he still thinks of himself in these ancient Greek terms, which he would never dream of using, but as a hero, who, who, and heroes do sometimes do the most implausible things and come back. So he hasn't, he hasn't sort of been wrecked in, in his own self-esteem, and he's not going to go off 
and live quietly in the country and do good work for the local church. Tom, Tom Bauer, who's also written uh, about um, Boris Johnson, puts uh, his failure, his fall down to um, COVID, carry uh, and character. Um, where do you rank those three in... in, uh, in I, I'm not... Well, I think it's very unfair to blame the spouse. Um, it, 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 if the failure um, or the failings were Boris Johnson's failings, not those of anyone else. Um, Sorry, what were the two other factors that were... The COVID and character. Well, I think I put it slightly differently. I'd say he was a brilliant insurgent who didn't... Uh, and he could be an insurgent until, the, un, until he'd won the election in December 2019. But after that, of course, he, he was commanding regular troops. He was commanding the whole regular apparatus of the state. And he wasn't a good... It doesn't matter not being a good administrator yourself, but you have to be a good employer of administrators. You have to tell them what you want them to do and let them get on with it. And he kept on changing his mind. And that meant that the machine, the, the gear sort of ground. It didn't know whether it was going forwards or backwards, what the direction, what the direction was. And there were some brilliant exploits like the vaccines, but there, were also, there was also a great deal of confusion and infighting in number 10. And that was, um, perhaps that was something to do with Boris Johnson's character, being a satirist, an upturner of apple carts. Um, uh, he, 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 he simply wasn't. He simply didn't take seriously all the things which the priggish, pr prudish sort of establishment types say you must. He hates Kant, and he thought that all this stuff about sort of sound administration was probably so much, and, and certainly about rules. That was rules to him were made to be broken, and of course that was part of his downfall that he broke the rules and was, and and, and had no satisfactory explanation for why he'd broken these these lockdown rules himself. You said it's unfair to uh, blame the spouse, to blame Carrie Johnson. I'm, I'm sure that's yes. true. Uh, but is it not also an interesting um, aspect of the way the public feels about Boris Johnson that so many people wanted to blame uh, his wife for his failings? It's sort of almost as though the Teflon factor just slid onto, onto her. They thought it has to be somebody else because they quite like him. Well, people look for the weak spot. And there were obviously a, a, a considerable number of people, including a considerable number of pundits who couldn't forgive him for Brexit. Um, and they, and they, of course, they, they condemned him as a liar. But had he been lying in order to keep Britain in the European Union, I don't think they would have been nearly so vociferous. They actually had a disagreement with him. It wasn't all about character. It was about policy. Was the policy to stay in the European Union or not? And this was a very deep and serious um, question. And he, he was on the wrong side of it as far as a great many of his critics were concerned, and that is what they, um, or, what they got more angry with him about than almost an, than anything else. I think uh, you talked about Brexit, but also I'm interested in what you say about Puritanism, because Boris seemed to uh, win over people because he was so unPuritan and so much fun and so amusing. Yes. Um, but ultimately, in the British character, do you think there's something puritanical that always has to win out? Not always has to win out. We have Gladstone versus Disraeli. We have the Cavaliers versus the Roundheads. The, the, the former Prime Minister who casts most light on Boris Johnson is Disraeli. He was a very disreputable man in his youth um, and caused enormous trouble by rebelling against the, the sober, sensible men of business led by Sir Robert Peel. Um, and he then, he, in, in old age, he told Lord Randolph Churchill, who was very, very... I mean, politics was much rougher and ruder then. Uh, and Randolph Churchill was calling the, the, the leader, the, the Conservative leader in the Commons, the Israeli successor, Sir Stafford Northcote, he called him a cretin and, also, and, and many other things which were equally rude. Um, and Disraeli said to Lord Randolph, look, could you sort of tone it down a bit, but admitted to him that he'd never been respectable himself. Well, Lord Randolph... Um, he had this amazing connection with the working class, but only for a very short time. Then he blew himself up. Then he died. And of course, he would be forgotten were it not for the fact that his son, Winston Churchill, carried on this tradition of Tory democracy, a, a rather loutish um, uh, and flamboyant element in the ruling class, making common cause with the working class, patriotism and improving the conditions of the workers uh, and laughing at the middle class prigs like Gladstone. And this is a, this is a, per, this is a, perpet, a permanent um, division in, in British politics. And usually the, 
the, um, the people like Disraeli and Johnson don't last in office for very long and don't always have very serious reforms to their credit, but they do, there, there is, our nation actually thrills, at least for a short time, to that kind of leadership, which you could also say that Winston Churchill provided in 1940, in, in, in obviously in more, much more serious circumstances. Well, uh, Liz Truss is uh, often accused of being uh, wooden, uh, and it's obviously she lacks uh, some of the sparkle of Boris Johnson, if you like. Um, do you think we, we, uh, it's that sort of football manager thing where you go from uh, different types of personality types um, and you end up getting fed up with each? I thought she did well at her first Prime Minister's questions and it was actually quite refreshing to hear a Conservative making economic arguments and doing so with conviction and I don't think anyone has done that very successfully since Margaret Thatcher and she was taking on the Labour Party and saying that you, don't, you can't tax your way to prosperity and um, her own troops loved that. And Labour, of course, stands open to the accusation of being against uh, the desire to better yourself, against aspiration and all this. So I thought she made a, she's made a strong start. Uh, I, mind you, Theresa May made a strong start. Uh, and you can't tell what's going to, what's going to, what we shall think in a year's time. You, you don't think we'll need um, 10 years of, of Labour before people even start to think about a, a Boris Johnson comeback? Not 10 years, no. Um, <laughs> we might need an interlude, though. But it, it, there are so many imponderables. And actually, part of the charm of politics, and particularly politics over the last half dozen years, is that no one, no expert has predicted what would happen. Um, we've, we've constantly been surprised. And I think we'll be surprised again. But Johnson is there as a big figure um, and as the greatest campaigner the Conservatives have had since Margaret Thatcher, um, and they may well regret not being led by him at the next general election. Is he still, uh, I'll give you a chance to wave your book around again, is he still uh, a, trouble, a troublemaker? Um, he, is, he is a troublemaker, he can't help it, um, but he's a, he's, a, he's, a, he's, a, he's a magnanimous troublemaker, he's not a sort of hater, he's, he, he doesn't sort of try to assassinate people. Um, he doesn't try to get even with his enemies. I mean, Gove knifed him in after the EU referendum. So Johnson, the front runner, fell then. Uh, but Gove came back as a member of the Johnson administration. So he's very good, which is an, obviously an essential thing in politics, to be able to make things up, um, um, to, to, to have a reconciliation with, or to keep a, 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 an incompatible coalition together. Um, Johnson managed that for a time, but then it, then it, um, latterly it fell apart. Andrew, thank you very much, uh, and best of luck with the book. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Moving on, let's talk about microchips. Uh, Francis Pike, who joins us now, uh, has written an excellent piece this week about how um, semiconductors, uh, which are very important to the workings of almost all advanced uh, digital technology, uh, are becoming the latest battleground in the global struggle between the US and China. He's here with uh, Cindy Yu, who is our broadcast editor and the um, host of our brilliant uh, Chinese Whispers podcast. Um, Francis, I'll start with you. Uh, you suggest that uh, America is getting the upper hand in the uh, kind of global war over microchips. Could you explain to us how? Well, I'd say first, America already has the upper hand, but what it's doing is making sure it continues to have the upper, upper hand going forward, and perhaps even to increase its advantages by denying China access to uh, the best lithography equipment, which is the key technology in chip fabrication. Can, can you tell us a little bit more about lithography? Because it's fascinating your piece about just how small and incredibly difficult it must be to create these films that they create. Uh, give us a sense of how small it is. Well, to, to give you a, uh, an example of this, um, when I was, when I was in, living in Japan in the, in, the, in the late 80s, I was looking at, at fa fabrication of semiconductors. And at that stage, semiconductors were, were being built at, at the 800 nanometer scale. Now, 800 na nanometers sounds quite a lot, but actually, it's, it's one hundredth the width of a human hair. 
but we're now down to five nanometers. So from 800 nanometers to, to five nanometers over, over the last 30 years. This is quite an extraordinary uh, advance in technology. Uh, and there, there is only one company that can do it uh, in, in the world, I think, and this is this Dutch company, which most people won't have heard of, but is actually the fourth biggest company in Europe or something, is it not? Yes, I mean, it was a market that was dominated in the, in the 80s and 90s by Nikon and Canon, the, the, the camera companies that we've, we've all heard of. But they lost out in the early 2000s to this, this uh, startup uh, Dutch company, it started in 84, but really made the big step forward in, in 2003 when it, when it developed, developed two things. One was immersion lithography, uh, which is doing the lithography under, under, underwater, firstly, and also what's called twin scale uh, lithography, which essentially is the ability to uh, prepare one wafer disc for, for lithography while the other one is, is, actu is actually being exposed to light. So it, it's, a product, it's a productivity uh, technique that they, they developed in their, in their machines, which are huge, by the way, They're the size of London buses. Uh, and, and now today, America has restricted uh, China's ability to buy uh, f from this company. Yes, one, you know, one doesn't know exactly how they've done it, whether they twisted the arms of the Dutch government or whether they twisted the arms of ASML, the, the Dutch company, directly. But, but whatever's, uh, what, however that's been done, uh, China now cannot buy the latest EUV machines, that's extreme ultra, ultraviolet lithography machines. And even if they could steal them, uh, they wouldn't be able to work them because you need so many uh, high-level operators, is that right? Well, they could, I, su I suppose in theory, they, if they conquered Taiwan, which you know, is, is something we're, we're all wonder, wondering about what Xi Jinping is going to do, I suppose they could, uh, they could then steal or steal machines and reverse engineer them to use for, uh, in China for their uh, biggest foundry, foundry company, which is based in Chang Shanghai. Cindy, uh, we, kn we, we know that uh, China has ambitions over Taiwan. Um, to what extent do you think uh, microchips are a motivating factor in uh, Xi's desire to, um, to take control of Taiwan and its manufacturing? I think one interesting outcome from America's um, arms race, as it were, with China on semiconductors, this measure to um, prevent China from getting its supplies globally, whether that's putting pressure on the Dutch government or the South Korean or the Japanese, is that actually China realises ever more if it really wants to crack semiconductors, it needs Taiwan. So I do wonder if the more uh, America basically protects um, the resources of its Western allies, the more it restricts this globalised supply chain, the more Xi Jinping is tempted to take Taiwan. Now, there are some in Taiwan who, as Francis has written in his piece, think that um, the TSMC, which is their world-leading um, fabric fabrication plant for uh, semiconductors, is a silicon shield for uh, the islands. But I'm not sure that is necessarily true, because I think Beijing is fully capable of overtaking, uh, overtaking the islands, but protecting that particular company and, and its manufacturing plants. Um, so I think it will actually contribute quite a lot uh, to China's calculations on Taiwan. I think, obviously, there are other factors at play. So, for example, Xi Jinping has his National Party Congress in just over a month's time. He's not going to want to rock the boat before then. But what happens after then when he's confirming a third term and uh, to his legacy of rejuvenating the Chinese people, um, Taiwan plays a very crucial role after that. Francis, uh, do, do, in, in your piece, you suggest that the, Xi Jinping might be aware that the window is closing because he's now falling so far behind in this crucial tech race, um, that that would uh, motivate him to invade Taiwan. Does, do, you, do you think the Chinese feel that they're, they're losing their window of opportunity to catch up? I think there's a, there's a problem here because, yes, they could invade Taiwan. I don't think the Taiwanese would, would do a scorched earth policy and blurt their own uh, fabrication foundries. So I think that's, that's unlikely. But if the, if the Chinese did get hold of, of the, the, the Taiwanese fabs, yes, they'd have the five nanometer 
technology lithography machines. But they, wouldn't, they then wouldn't get access to the next generation machines. Now, at the end of this, this year, um, uh, Apple is, move, is moving to, to three nanometers. Uh, with the Taiwanese f fabrication companies going to three nanometers. And then in, in 2025, they're going to what's called the angstrom level. Now, the angstrom level is, is at the atomic level. Uh, that's one ten billionth of a nanometer. So that's an, one angstrom is the size of, of an atom, say a, a chlorine atom or a, um, uh, or a sulfur atom is about one angstrom. So you're talking about atomic, atomic scale. And you know, hyd a hydrogen atom, for example, is, is 0.5 angstroms. So here you're, you're moving to whole new areas of, of techno technology. And again, the company that appears to be in the lead on this is ASML. And they're the only company in the world that looks to have any chance of getting, getting lithography to this, to this level. And so, yes, I mean, Xi Jinping might be able to take control of the fabs, but then he'd be, his companies would be denied access to the, ne to the next generations of, of lithography machines. Cindy, uh, d d Francis says in his piece that America's investing more in its own microchip uh, capabilities. China has done a lot too. Um, it's perhaps slightly surprising why has China fallen behind um, with its emphasis on technology? Is it perhaps, and perhaps this is a horrible slur, so correct me if it is, that it's become too dependent on stealing technology, so much so that it's not actually very good at innovating it? Well, this is something that I asked my guest, um, Nigel Inkster, formerly of the MI6, and who has written a book about technological decoupling coming down the line uh, in this world, um, when he came onto my podcast, Chinese Whispers, to talk about semiconductors early in the year. And he made the analogy that unlike something like high-speed rail, which China is now uh, very good at building, and he says that uh, they stole the plans, a lot of the blueprints from Japan, um, unlike something like that, semiconductors requires much more of a finger feel, much more of this um, kind of passed down know-how that is much, much harder um, to steal or procure otherwise. Um, and so that is one of the reasons. There was also a point about how China, through the Cultural Revolution, really for a decade, um, didn't appreciate science and te technology. And that is a, a very crucial decade in this particular industry that we're talking about. Um, China now is pretty pretty panicked about its lack of progress on this front. It's pledged over $100 billion into its domestic industry. And throughout the summer, actually, there's been anti-graft probes, basically, into anyone who is anyone in a semiconductor world in China, because the government is thinking, why haven't you cracked this? There must be corruption. And maybe there is, maybe there's not, because you know, it could just be the government kind of throwing its toys out of the pram there. But Beijing definitely knows it's a problem uh, and is trying to fix it. And maybe with a new cohort of people who are less corrupt, that is, that is going to be the way to fix it. But we'll, we'll have to see. Francis, for a tech moron like me, could you just uh, quickly explain why is it so important uh, for nations that they don't fall behind, uh, or for superpowers that they don't fall behind on microchip technology? The, the reason is that whatever technologies you're wanting to develop, you need the most advanced chips. And that applies whether it's cloud computing, whether it's supercomputers, whether it's artificial intelligence, or whether it's uh, genome sequencing. For example, uh, NVIDIA, which is the leading uh, company in the world in, in terms of producing uh, graphic processing units, GPUs, um, its newest um, chip uh, is seven times faster than its previous generation chip. So again, NVIDIA's products have been banned from the Chinese market uh, by, by the Biden administration. Now that means that you know, China can, if it can't get access to these chips, it can, it's never going to catch up in in, in areas like um, you know, gene you know, genetic, genetic engineering and so on. So it's not just uh, you know, computers and telephones and, uh, and so on. It's, it's the whole gamut of high, te high technology. Francis and Cindy, thank you very much indeed. Now let's talk about the BBC uh, and the apparently never ending question of bias uh, within the British Broadcasting Corporation. I'm joined now by Rod Liddell, uh, the much-loved, the great spectator columnist. 
Uh, and we're going to be talking about... He's just stopped abusing us, I should say, about the quality of our set here at Spectator TV. Uh, having worked at the BBC, Rod, uh, you're used to higher standards of broadcasting. Um, but in your column this week, you talk about uh, a possible new direction for the BBC um, based on the fact that Newsnight seems to have dropped its bias, which you describe uh, brilliantly as um, a kind of broadcasted Hampstead Garden suburb slip page of The Guardian. Uh, that was what it was in its previous incarnation. Um, it has seemed to have changed direction, and you're saying it's better as a result. I think it's much better. Uh, instead of having four women debating and being very miserable with each other, uh, uh, especially about right-wing people and the Tories, uh, there's now a kind of breadth to the interviews. You occasionally indeed see a man um, uh, on them. Um, uh, and and uh, I think, you know, Mark Urban particularly um, is very, very even-handed. You know, I've, I've heard a number of interviews where the interviewee has been... Uh, quizzed from both left and right, um, uh, which, which is kind of the way it's meant to be. It's it's become sharper in its coverage of politics. Um, it's more intelligent rather than a kind of scream fest of, of, of outrage and abuse. And I would put that down to a change of editor and a change of presenters, uh, which is... I, I think will come as no surprise to your to your uh, to, to your viewers, which is that uh, Esme Wren, who was the editor, uh, has left, and so has the presenter Emily Maitlis, and so has Lewis Noel or whatever he's called. Uh, they've all they've all gone, uh, and so the and so the program has become immeasurably better. I mean, they need to deal with their production team, which, when I met them, seemed to be a convocation of perpetually uh, uh, triggered adolescents. Uh, uh, with with the kind of collective IQ of uh, a small tank of plankton, um, but, but I, I suspect it's got better than that. Uh, the the point being, I mean, the point I was making, uh, you know, I guess the BBC, uh, if it was looking at a news and current affairs program, needs to find an audience for it, and it might well think that a that a a, a kind of left liberal inclined program might be an audience winner. Uh, and it should. My my honest belief is that it should be allowed to do that. If that's what it wants to do, but not at the same time make the pretense that it's neutral. But the whole point of the Newsnight uh, business is that back in 2010 it had an audience of close on a million, you know, 900,000. Uh, and <laughs> Esme and Emily managed to shred that down to nearly 200,000 across, you know, 10 years. I mean, that is astonishing. It is an astonishing um, degradation of what was the BB's flagship current affairs programme, you know, and, and, you know, we all remember the good old days of Newsnight. My hope is that they might now be coming back. But it, it's remarkable that it was allowed to go on for so long without someone saying, you know, aren't we just alienating our audience with this kind of shriek fest? Right. Um, to which, you know, Esme, Wren and Emily Maitlis would reply, but look at what our Twitter followers are saying, uh, which, is, which is what the left always does. The left thinks that Twitter is the world. Uh, and undoubtedly, they were, they were kind of cocooned in a sort of bubble, both within a uh, new broadcasting house, uh, but also in a bubble of, uh, of that kind of, I suppose, there's about 200,000 of them, i.e. the people who watch Newsnight. Who yep. uh, you still watch Newsnight? Who are perpetually on Twitter, perpetually outraged by anybody who ever mentions the word Tory, um, and will uh, are relentlessly active. I mean, the, the studies of Twitter have shown that those people do exist. Uh, so it got it terribly wrong. And you might ask yourself, why didn't they stop it before? Uh, but they didn't. They they the, the BBC can sometimes be very very defensive. Well, something odd happened, I think, during the Corbyn years, which was that um, people on Twitter uh, and that diminishing section of the public that watched Newsnight convinced themselves that the BBC was becoming um, dangerously right-wing. Uh, and this is something you touch on in your column that Emily Maitlis said recently that it seems to have been hijacked by a, 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 a right-wing agenda. I mean, to any sane person, I think that's just nonsense, isn't it? 
Well, it's it's not just nonsense. It's hilarious. But credit to Emily, but I'm meeting just about the only conservative in the BBC, which is Robin Gibb, who's on the BBC board. Uh, I know about Newsnight. <laughs> you know, I, I I've been on it before. Uh, I've done programmes for little little uh, uh, features for Newsnight. I can tell you that there was only one person in the entire Newsnight staff who voted for Brexit. You know, I mean, that is the level of bias. And it, 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 I would suggest it's probably not much different at the Today programme World at One and so on. Um, uh, it is incalculably liberal lefty, I mean, to an incalculable degree. Uh, I don't think it's hard left wing. Uh, these are affluent middle class people who want to keep their incomes uh, when questions of taxation come up. They, they often become somewhat less left wing than either two. Uh, uh, but it's left wing on particularly cultural stuff, on immigration, on most foreign affairs, but particularly Israel. Uh, and and it, it's been it's been like that for decades, yeah, and it was pretty much like that when I was there. But it became unapologetically, stridently, and brazenly like that at Newsnight for a period of about ten to twelve years, and you saw what happened as a result: the audience left in absolute droves. Do you, do you think it might be just a question of journalistic intelligence rather than bias? Um, in that the BBC's always had a quite strong left-wing bias. As you yourself said, when you were there, there was a strong left-wing bias. No, uh, I don't think it, no, hang on. I, I don't think it always has. Oh, you don't think it always uh, has? I think left, no, I think the left-wing bias kind of um, grew up during the late 80s, early 90s, along with the, the you know, it's the, it's the Gramsci march, march through the institutions uh, yeah. and a change in our establishment. Yes. It became a liberal elite rather than a right-wing elite. I think, Back in the seventies, you could you could probably say that the that the BBC was kind of a voice of small c conservatism in many ways. And certainly, when you look at light entertainment within the BBC back in the seventies, all the big stars Bruce Forsyth, Jimmy Tarbuck, Malcolm and Weiss, the two Ronnies, uh, all those all those kinds of people, Cilla Black, Lulu, Cliff Richard, all of them Tories. You yeah. know, all of them Tories. Uh, yeah. Whereas today, if you look at, at the light entertainment. Um, if, if it's possible by what stretch of the imagination to call Joe Lysett entertainment, uh, you'll find that they are all um, uh, they are all tending to the left uh, when they're not actually claiming to be female uh, if they're male. Um, think of Joe, what did you think of Joe Lysett's uh, much talked about performance on Sunday on Laura Kusenberg's new show? Well, I thought it was exactly what you would expect from Joe Lysett in being A, not funny, and B, left-wing. <laughs> you know, and that seems to be... I, I think there must be an interview room, a bit like the room you're sitting in now, uh, Fred, <laughs> uh, at the BBC, where uh, potential comedians for uh, the BBC are, are, are interviewed, and they say to them, uh, we just need to check a couple of things first. Firstly, are you funny? No, not at all. Are you uh, uh, someone who hates a Conservative Party? Yeah, I really hate them. OK, you're in. Um, because it is remarkable, the, the number of comedians and, and performers who who just aren't funny. And I don't think this is just me. Uh, they just aren't funny. But they do have the right views, you know. Uh, and you think of all the great comedians who don't get on. People like Paul Chowdhury, for example, uh, who's a really, really good comedian. And is almost never on the BBC, despite his videos uh, and DVDs selling out, you know, selling masses, masses across the country, far more than Joe Lysa ever sells. Paul Chowdhury uh, sold out the, uh, what did he, he sold out something massive, Wembley, I think, you know, I mean, he's a really big figure. And he's, he's not a Jim Davidson, who also has a case to it, um, or a Roy Chubby Brown, he's a serious and very funny comedian from our ethnic minorities. But because he can't be pigeonholed by his views, the BBC can't stand it. Do you think, I mean, you talk about uh, a question of sport in your column. Is it just uh, light, the fact that light entertainment now has to be a bit more political because the culture wars have taken over? Yeah, well, I think the BBC presumably thinks that. I think the rest of the country thinks it doesn't. The, the, the question of sport thing is, 
it is inconceivable what they did. I mean, you know, it is just so fantastically stupid. But though it does go along with their defenestration of Andrew Neil uh, and indeed uh, uh, Jeremy Clarkson uh, in the end, you know, really, really popular people who may have views with which uh, the rest of us here at New Broadcasting House uh, don't share. But what they did, they got rid of Sue Barker. And with Sue Barker, uh, who was an incredibly popular presenter, incredibly popular, 24 years there, they got rid of uh, 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 Phil Tufnell and uh, Matt Dawson, who were the team captains. And they had a chemistry. I, I mean, the question of sport isn't my favourite programme. The only sport I really like is football. Um, uh, and, and there was precious little of it on that programme. Uh, but they undoubtedly had a chemistry and they were incredibly popular. They got 5 million viewers, nearly 5 million viewers. They get rid of Sue Barker. They lie to the press and say that Sue Barker wanted to stand down, which Sue Barker then uh, uh, immediately uh, corrected and said, I didn't want to. Um, so they lie about getting rid of Sue Barker. They get rid of Matt Dawson and Phil Tuffnell and bring in Paddy McGuinness and I need to look this up. Ugo Monia, you know Ugo, come on. Ugo Monia and Sam Quack. Sam Quack. Um, and so they get Sam Quack and Ugo Monia in. 800,000, that's how many people watch it now. Now, in any other institution or corporation, Someone who made that decision and saw that result would be sacked. You know, they would be sacked. I mean, that is a, it is a fantastically uh, catastrophic decision to have made. And it also brought odium on the BBC uh, with, with Sue Barker, um, uh, saying that she felt very hurt and insulted. So it was a massive own goal, rather like the last night of the proms was an own goal. But has anyone bitten the bullet for it? Nobody at all. What you're not getting, Rod, is that it's about the kids. Yes, it's about the kids. They're perpetually in search of the 18 to 30 uh, age group. Um, but the 18 to 30 age group find them as irrelevant and pointless as the rest of us are beginning to find them. Uh, the, the, you will not bring in 18 to 30 volts with Paddy McGuinness and Ugo Monia and Sam you, you know, that isn't going to do it. Um, you know, and that is not really what their job is. You know, that has never been their job. Their job is to provide information and entertainment, you know, and that is, their, that is the point of their existence. They ought to be looking at the people who actually pay the licence fee and asking, you know, um, uh, what do you guys want? Uh, instead of taking this approach which seems to be drawn from uh, Hugh Green, the previous uh, Director General, which is, you know, we're going to rub their noses in it. We don't care if they hate it. Uh, we're here to make them better people. That seems to be the point of view of all the adolescents working for the BBC. Um, with the exception of those, perhaps now in current affairs, there is a bit of a change, afoot, which is incredibly welcome. Well, Rod, we'll stop there, but thank you very much. As you know, the Spec TV uh, audience skews very highly towards the 18 to 30 demographic. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it does, doesn't it? That is it for the week in 16 minutes. Thank you very much for watching. Do please keep watching in the future.